This is Shiv Jagde, former Canadian and U.S. national team hockey coach. I learned my hockey as a teenager in Ludhiana, Punjab, while observing, learning, imitating, and dreaming to be as good as the members of the Indian hockey team which won the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games gold medal. The purpose of this presentation is to share my inner views regarding India's revival and success at the international level. What was their secret? What were the key factors from the coaching point of view? There were five critical factors for this gradual change and improvement. Number one was leadership at the top and management and organization. Number two, the role of foreign coaches. Number three, the role of Indian coaches at the grassroots level, in the trenches, in the small towns and villages, in the academies and nurseries. Number four, competition hosting, exposing the Indian hockey players to foreign um, superstars and their coaches. Number five, sponsorship. As you know, money makes the mayor go. So let's cover these topics one by one. It's no secret that Narendra Batra is the visionary leader behind India's success. He is a man who knows how to make things happen with his unique style. He leads with the iron fist. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind as a leader. At the same time, he has contributed a lot and brought us a lot of changes, not only on the Indian hockey scene, but at the International Hockey Federation scenes also. We know that he has a magic touch of getting sponsorships and pouring money. We also know that nobody can do it on his own. He has a good, effective management team around him who have also worked very hard. Next, coming to the role of foreign coaches in reviving Indian hockey. Nobody can undermine that. They have done wonders with the Indian hockey program. They introduced more tactics and scientific training methods which our hockey, Indian hockey players were never ever exposed to. Now I like to give a little bit background of how and when did Indian hockey start realizing that they need the services of a foreign coach. As far as I remember, in the 1990s, Ashwini Kumar, president of the Indian Hockey Federation in the 1960s, suggested that we should hired a foreign coach and he also recommended the name of Horst Wein, the master FIH coach from Germany, but this thing never materialized. Then in 2004, before the 8th Olympic Games, coach Cheryl Rack from Germany came on the scene and he coached the Indian team at the 8th Olympic Games. In 2007, Rick Charlesworth, a famous Australian coach who guided his national women's team to win back-to-back -back two Olympic gold medals and two World Cups in the 1990s, joined Indian Hockey Federation as its technical director. It is no secret that Coach Rick has a special place in his heart for Indian hockey, and he always wants to see it develop and grow. This is simply due to the fact that he learned his hockey from a Anglo Indian coach who had immigrated to Australia from India and his name was Merv Adams. Australian hockey players and coaches admire and recognize the role the Anglo Indians have played in developing hockey in Australia and they appreciate it immensely. During his short stay in India, Coach Rick also visited. Sajit Hockey Academy in Jalandhar during the summer of 2008 while there was a seminar and player development camp being organized by Sukhveer Singh Garewal, Director High Performance Punjab Institute of Sports. In this photograph we can see Coach Rick conducting a practical session which was very educating and entertaining. In the background, you can see the budding stars from the Punjab 
institute of sports and among them are sitting some players who represented India at the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games for example Manpreet Mandeep were sitting somewhere in the photograph in the back. Coach Rick soon left for Australia. Indian hockey team did not qualify for the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games for the first time in its history of more than 80 years when they started participating in the Olympic Games. This was a big shock. Indian hockey gurus started brainstorming and they came up with a plan which saw coach Jose Brasa from Spain taking charge of the Indian hockey team. Coach Brasa was the first coach who introduced the Indian hockey players to modern tactics, scientific training methods and the main thing which he added to the team was circulating the ball in the back, playing direct and indirect hockey. Another strategic move which he made was that bring Sardara Singh from the position of the right inner to centre half and that had a powerful influence on the team's performance as Sardara played very well in this midfield position and that was a classic move. No question, Coach Brasa sowed the seeds of greatness of which we all reaped the fruits during the 20. 20 Tokyo Olympic Games. It is not going to be fair if the contribution of all the coaches who came after Coach Brasa era, if their contribution is not recognized. Then came Coach Michael Nobbs from Australia, Coach Terry Walsh from Australia, Coach Paul Venez from Netherlands, Coach Roland Oltmans from Netherlands. They all played a big role in developing the Indian hockey team's technical, tactical skills, mental skills, physical skills. They had a scientific team around them. They all operated as a team and that's the reason the job was much easier for the coach Graham Reed who came on the scene. And he carried on and built and kept on building from that and that's why he the Indian hockey team is where it is today. Let's see what went behind the scenes. What was the secret of the India's success? What did these modern coaches do? What did they bring on the table? Why were we so successful? And there's a turnaround. I would go from my point of view as a coach that what exactly these foreign coaches did was they worked in the four key elements of the team development, technical, tactical, physical and mental. And then from the motion angle they brought team discipline, they brought belief system, they taught us how to play as a playing as a team, they taught us that we versus me and who misbehaved, he was shown the bench no mercy, treating everyone equally. They gave the work ethic, work ethic and there was a chemistry and I would also say that captain's role, Manpreet and Rani, was outstanding. Just to give credit where it is due, I also like to mention this, is this that although all these foreign coaches brought a lot of hard skills and their mastery to the team, but one area which the credit should go to the coaches in the trenches and also to the natural talent which is gifted to the Indian hockey players, that is soft skills. It is fair to say that Indian coaches developed talent and foreign coaches managed talent. And it is a good partnership, a win-win situation. All the academies, the different parts of the company played a key role in developing talent. To name a few, Orissa Hockey Academy, Papal Hockey Academy, Shabat Hockey Academy and the Academy in Punjab, Punjab Institute of Sports. To look deeper into the academies, what goes around there, how do they develop talent, I like to take the example of the academy in Punjab. As there were more than 50% players from the men's national team which won a bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games. It all started in 2005 when Pargit Singh, former captain of the Indian hockey team, 
was appointed as the director of sports Punjab. He and Subir Singh, his coach at the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games, got together and put a plan together and developed hockey and bring the revolution in Punjab. And this is how it started. This is the model which was adopted by Punjab Institute of Sports. They had a they had this primary center and they had sub centers and in this each center there were coaches uh, who were former Olympians or former hockey players and they were given training and this is the way they operated. For the from the physical point of view, the primary center was in Jalandhar which was hosted by Sujit Hockey Academy. In the same way, various sub-centers were located in the various cities and districts of the state. These sub-centers acted as a feeder system to the primary center. If any player who was outstanding, they were graduated from uh, these centers to the primary center. For example, uh, Harman Preet Singh and Akash Deep were, uh, were at the Malwa Hockey Academy Center in Ludhiana. Uh, and when they showed their talent, they were transferred to the primary sub-center, which is under Sajid Hockey Academy, as we have uh, talked about. How are these hockey academies designed and formed, and what happens inside them? Let's take an example of the Malwa Hockey Academy which is basically a residential hockey academy with a, with a, as a boy boarding school. So the students go to the school in Malwa High School and they come to train at the Prithipal Hockey Stadium. So this is the way it's formed and united. Usually the budding stars in this academy train twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Usually in the morning is only skill training and physical training and the, in the evening uh, there's the tactical training and games and it all depends upon the weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly plan as designed by Sukhveet Singh Garewal, the director of high performance. Usually these training sessions are one and a half hours in the morning and two and a half hours in the evening. The motto is quality training versus quantity training target training, developing targeted technical and tactical skills under game situations. And this also applies to all the training centers under the Punjab Institute of Sport. I also like to mention here is this, that there's nothing new and for the um, advanced countries and their program is far advanced, but the reason I'm going into this little details is for some academies which may operate in a different way, here's a new way, and especially in the developing countries, that how they can bring this model over there. They may not be able to afford the model, which is an Australian, Australia Institute of Sports. Now to have a little bit deeper look with the ants view, I like to take you to the Batinda Hockey Center, where I had a good fortune to go with Sukhveer and work with the head coach, Rajvan Man in 2015. You will see that they had only 15 to 20 kids who were from 8 to 12 years. And now, when in 2021, you see the difference. And I want to show this through the photographs and, and, and a training session, what little things they do. Now, I'd like to show you this video clip where in one part of the practice session, what we did together to develop one skill at a time, one particular skill at a time. In this video clip, Sukhveer is demonstrating how to run with the ball with the stick feints and all of a sudden change the pace. He's basically showing them this is more or less used by the forward. Now he's showing in the slow motion, just observe, he's showing how to do the stick feints and then take off. Very simple but a very effective skill. Now the young players are demonstrating, look at the young kid, how she zigzag running with the ball, leaving the ball in front of her and then doing. This is basically for the forwards. Now let's observe these young players in slow motion. Look at the, the budding star, how she's running zigzag, big strides. This is just to unbalance the opponent as a forward. When you do this little shuffle dance, you'll see that the forward will know which way you're going. And it's a very effective uh, skill. Here, coach 
which Rajwant is demonstrating how to drop your shoulder and open your stick to be deceptive and dodge the opponent. This move is specifically applying to the right hand position. Look here how he has dropped the right shoulder and opened the stick so the you saw that the defender bought the dummy as soon as he opened the stick and dropped his right shoulder. And these little things are what are needed in a running game situation to eliminate the opponent. Now he's going to show that he's going to go to a right and his left and the defender takes it then he can easily go towards his right with the open stick. Just little things you have to pause and be deceptive and you can be a very effective player. Let's watch it in slow motion. Now he's opening his stick showing the defender that he's going to pass to his right side selling him a dummy and then he taps in and he goes towards his left. Next he's showing that how he can open drop his right shoulder open the stick and this was a famous move of Manzoor Jr. one of the great Pakistani hockey players in the 80s. See he has dropped his shoulder now to sell a dummy if the defender doesn't buy he can give the ball to the right finger or to his right side and if he buys he can go to the other side. Creating a the alternative choice situation. Very effective move. This is how the girls in 2015 in their pre-teens and early teens were running with the ball under Sugri's coaching. And this is how they look in 2021. You can see the difference and how they have developed. Now I like to touch base with the number four factor competition and hosting, the role it plays in developing hockey in the nation and especially the elite, the youth players as they are exposed to the very best of the best in the world in the backyard. The first time India hosted a World Cup was in 1982 Bombay. It took 28 more years to host the next World Cup which came to New Delhi in 2010. Then India again hosted the 2018 Odisha World Cup and now they are going to host the 2022 World Cup in Odisha again. Apart from this, in the recent past, India has also hosted Junior World Cups, FIH World Hockey Leagues and hosting the HIL, Hockey India League. I'd like to talk a little bit about Hockey India League. It had a very powerful impact on the hockey players from India, especially the young and upcoming. What it did was it gave an opportunity to be come closer to the best of the best in the world, talk with them, play with them, and play against them. This boosted their confidence, making them believe that, hey, they are no better than us, we are equally good. And this played a mighty role in building the self-belief and confidence of the Indian hockey players, again, especially the younger ones. Plus, it also exposed to the massive youth of India who learned also from the very best, the best, the latest techniques, tactics. In short, this did wonders to the Indian hockey. Another key point which is to be noted is that the Indian players were also exposed to the very best coaches of the world. Let's take an example of coach Barry Dancer from Australia who, ha who is the only coach in Australia who has won a Olympic gold medal for the men and the Junior World Cup for the men. The players and the coaching staff which worked under coach Barry were exposed to his style of teaching, his style of giving feedback, how he managed the team, how he developed the players, and this was a big benefit to learn from the one of the top coaches in the world. And then all these coaches and these players filtered it down to their club teams, their youth programs, and it and it had a compounding 
positive effect. Next, the number five factor, which is sponsorship. We know money makes the mayor go. And here is the list of all the sponsors which has played the role in Indian hockey. To advocate and elaborate my point, I'd like to take the example of Orissa government, which was the official sponsor of the Indian hockey team since 2018 when Sahara could not carry on. The leader of this government is Naveen Patnaik G, a true gentleman with a heart of gold, soft-spoken, generous, kind, and caring. He has extended Orissa government sponsorship with the Indian hockey teams for another 10 years. Lucky Hockey India. Now I like to touch base with the Indian women's hockey team and the performance at the Tokyo Olympic Games. They had an outstanding tournament. They surprised everyone and won everyone's heart. It was encouraging to see the way commentators were praising their skill sets, especially their elimination skills, playmaking moves. I was impressed with their never die attitude, fighting spirit. They attacked like a tiger and defended like a tiger with their back towards their wall. They played bravely and no wonder they surprised everyone. The credit should go to the coaching staff, the head coach and his team of coaches who did wonders with this team. They built their confidence. They made them believe in, them, in themselves. I remember the key match against Australia in the quarterfinal match in the halftime, how the assistant coach talked with Savita and how Savita's face was cool and calm. And same did the coaching staff did during the break. They built their confidence. They gave them faith. They gave them renewed uh, belief system. This was wonderful. Where as women's hockey was concerned, there were four primary academies, namely Shabbat Hockey Academy, Sonipat Hockey Academy, DSYW Hockey Academy, and Neville Tata Hockey Academy. The head coaches over there were Baldev Singh at Shabbat Hockey Academy, uh, Pritam at Sonipat Hockey Academy, Paramjit Singh at, uh, at DSYW Hockey Academy and I don't know the names of the coaches at the Neville Tata Hockey Academy. What I understand is they have visiting coaches also from Europe, for example, Bo Volander visited this academy very often. Bo Volander, the famous Dutch hockey player in the 90s. There were three players each from these academies who represented India at the Tokyo Olympic Games and there was one player from Punjab and one from Sai Hisar. A interesting and contrasting fact, fact which has been emerged is this that the first two academies in Haryana, Shahabad and Sonipat academies were run on a shoestring budget whereas the other two academies were run on the latest scientific basis with the state of the art infrastructure and backing. The simple reason for this was that these two academies had the backing of two powerful people. The first one had Shotra Raja Sindhya G. She belonged to a royal family and for Neville Tata it was Ratan Tata G, the son of Neville Tata. Um, they had both these personalities have power, influence and deep pocket deep pockets. Now, both these academies have developed players in their own style. If you look at the first two academies, it reminds me of the Brazilian soccer is, is developed. As well as the others, it reminds me of the Australian Institute of Sports or the Germany Youth Elite Development Program where the players are developed on scientific basis, latest research, having all the facilities uh, which one needs. Both produce equal results. So I'll, I think so. The key factor which makes a difference is 
of course the facilities and the infrastructure helps a lot but the key difference is the type of coaches who coach at these academies that's the difference and I also believe that the coach doesn't have to be a scientist to develop a, a youth hockey player he has to know a deep knowledge of hockey and know what to teach and what not to teach and what to correct and how to develop a young hockey player and this was proven very clearly by Balwev Singh with Shahabad, Pritam in Sonipat and these were unsung heroes who worked behind the scenes to develop such talented hockey players Paramjit Singh from Gwalior and this academy is also known as Mahela Hockey Academy as these three coaches they came from a very modest background but they had the passion for the game and to share the knowledge and develop the talent for the national coaching staff as they were the masters of molding the players into a winning combination now I like to touch base with the topic which is known as match management and bench management what you talk to the players during the breaks how you communicate and how you motivate there's more than one way of doing the things if, if I look at the match a crucial quarterfinal match of the women's section Australia played India Australia were number rank number two ranked team in the world and they were the favorites whereas India were the underdogs in this game one key difference was the coach of the Australian team was up in the stands and the coach of the Indian women's hockey team was on the bench and here are some scenes um, which say a lot and I also want to make it clear over here yes I'm putting myself vulnerable with my views but these are my views one depicts a general leading his army on the field and the another leads with the, with the journal sitting in his air conditioned office both styles are good you know nothing wrong but you can see in this crucial game when the underdogs needed the most moral sport what did the coaches uh, do on the field here's some photographs look the way they they made the players feel safe on the field and let them know that everything will be okay on the bench on the other hand uh, the general did have his tiptees on the field but I don't think so what the general can do with this team army when he is leading it on the field it's a big morale booster now once again I like to go over the areas where the Indian team made vast improvement they were basically in set plays offensive and defensive field goal scoring plus tactics as a team no more conceding goals to the dying minutes and no more status by the coaches lady luck too was simply not on our side and the team performed consistently in the peak performance zone and that was the biggest difference in this team and you can see that uh, Ravinder Pal Singh scored three plenty strokes in this tournament and if you look at the past you're going from the 1973 World Cup to the 1976 Olympic Games and the various tournaments we missed the boat due to not converting the plenty strokes at the key moments you know otherwise the first World Cup would have landed in India in 1973 here I like to bring to everyone's notice there was a young player named as Mahindra Singh his pet name was Munshi he played in the 1975 World Cup in Kuala Lumpur which India won he scored every plenty stroke India was awarded two against England and one against Germany I have to double check about this one and there was another game where he scored a plenty stroke he, was, he had no international experience, he used to play as a centre half but he was selected as a left half because centre half Ajit Pal, Pal, Ajit Pal was playing and Mahinder replaced Harmeek Singh who was the, in the left half position who was the captain of the Indian team at the 1972 Munich Olympic Games.
Another point to be noted over here is in those days there were no TVs but we used to hear a commentary and in that tournament her Charan Singh left winger who was a who had played in 72 Olympics uh, and also played in the 76 Olympics he had one of his best tournaments and the simple reason behind that was that Minda was so skillful a playmaker very intelligent hockey player he used to draw the opponent's right half and all the players and then dump the through ball to her churn it was uh, just a e easy pass to pick it up and uh, show his skills so that is what midfield game intelligence and playmaking makes move makes makes a difference past is the part of the present and future we have to know our past to go into the future with clear direction and clarity in other words we have to know where we have been and we where we want to go and this way we can go into the future with optimism and a clear plan now what i like to see is go over the, the indian hockey's racket in the olympics and world cups and see how the mighty fall and rise when we look at this chart regarding india's performance in the olympic games it is very clear that the decline started in 1976 Montreal Olympic Games where India did not make the semi-finals for the first time since it started participating in the Olympic Games. Another key point to be noted is this that India lost to Australia by the margin of 6-1 and this sent shock waves around the world because India were the defending World Cup champions the year before. And this played a big role in Indian hockey's confidence and mentality to approach the foreign teams. The decline kept on going and it hit the rock bottom when India did not qualify for the Olympic Games for the first time in 2008 Beijing. Now where as the World Cup is concerned, India's decline started in 1978 when they finished sixth as they had finished first in 1975 Kuala Lumpur World Cup. And the decline kept on going with some peaks and valleys in between, but it hit the rock bottom again when they finished 12th at the London 1986 World Cup. When we observe this chart under a microscopic eye it is clear that the decline started in 1975 after winning the World Cup and in in London World Cup where India finished 12th and then it took a nose dive and hit the rock bottom in 2006 and 2008 when they did not qualify for the Olympic Games and then after that it started doing the recovery journey and it took them 49 years to win a real medal in the Olympic Games where all the top guns participated. Yes, they won the gold medal in 1980 Moscow Olympic Games, credit due to them. But not all the top guns were competing at that, World Cup, at that Olympic Games. So the lesson we have to learn is this, that there's a slip between a lip and a cup. Never take anything easy never be overconfident always have paranoid optimism thinking that what can go right and what can go wrong and how to cover it the message we are trying to give is to the indian hockey team for men and women that it's going to be not easy yes you, india has come a long way but there's a long way to go to be a respected and feared team as are the Brazil, Belgians and the Dutch women. As these four teams, Belgium and Netherlands, hold the, nine, and hold the World Cup and Olympic titles between them. So, point is that, let not success go to your head, as it did in 1975. The danger I see is that when the Indian team came back from Montreal Olympics, uh, sorry, from Kuala Lumpur in 1975, 
they were given the hero's welcome they were going on the jeeps with uh, the gar- merry gold garlands in their in their necks and they were on top of the world and what happened you know this and the same thing is happening with the men and the women you know let not success go to our head number 1 and number 2 be aware of what needs to be improved upon to be near the role models of belgium and netherlands in my view both indian teams are not very far behind them maybe maybe few yards but that few yards are very hard to cover and india has to know what it needs to do to cover that gap and that's the job of the coaching staff it's not going to be easy but it is worth it as long as they work single mindedly and respect their foreign coaches and respect the coaches who have worked in the trenches here i like to make another point from a psychological point of view or intuition let's go back to the quarter finals where india played australia in the women's section australia came into this match thinking that we have to just walk in and it's our game they had overconfidence and they were caught napping because they didn't expect india to come that strong and then the things went out of the control and then the panicky button started on i just like to give you a flavor of when a pro gives a commentary how good he is in explaining the situation whereas i am no way close to him here's example the gb camp looked apprehensive before the bronze medal clash against india understandably so things have changed rapidly since gb outclassed india in the pool match 4-1 after that the indian girls fought to the nail to win their last two matches against ireland and south africa and make the quarter finals where they sprung a coup of epic proportions to eliminate australia in the semi finals rani rampal's team went down narrowly to argentina almost equalizing with seconds to go india looked buoyant sure there's a bronze medal at stake but the pressure is more on gb gold medalist four years ago who know now that they have a fight on their hands against the resurgent india the importance of deception and the surprise element in winning key matches you do well you alert your enemies never ever let them know about your strength but the problem is these days these teams play so much hockey and the video analysis and everything so everyone knows what the opponent's strength is and what their weakness is and this is where the, the great coaches and their team the sporting team does a great job but still i'm saying one thing a good player is a player who can do what he wants when he wants and where he wants even though if the defender knows about it. let me give an example of norman hughes a great hockey player for gb who played as a left winger and left half marvelous he did wonders i'm talking about the 80s once he said on the facebook this manzoor bugger i knew he what he was going to do he still did it he still passed it and that is what messi does and that is what ronaldo does and this is what you need the players on a team every team in the in the world and by the way india has not won very many so this is the biggest strength I also like to bring it to the notice of the younger generation and the hockey lovers all over the world that India was leading in their coaching process in the 60s and 70s there was a national institute of sports in Patiala which had a 9 month course to develop coaches and a lot of coaches have come through that program and a uh, well you can imagine if India had a national institute of sports in 1961 how far ahead they were from some of the countries in the world you know um now another point i like to make is this that i know there is a coaching education pathway on hockey india's website and i'm saying this with utmost respect i think so it's very good it's very important because it teaches how to teach and what to teach 
all the Indian nuts and bolts of coaching, but also there's another important aspect which is showing the players how to play the game, how to achieve the skills on the field. You know, the theory is very important, practical is very important. I like to take the example of all the hockey playing nations, which has produced a lot of theory coaches. They are marvelous in theory, but they cannot teach a young kid how to hold the stick, push the ball, and receive the ball. Our coach educators also need to develop the practical skills of our coaches so they can demonstrate correctly. As we know the law of imitation, the young players learn by seeing. When our coaches will start demonstrating the technical skills correctly, our young players will pick them up and make a part of their game. So, theory is important, practical is important, both are equally important. This is one of the reasons that hockey has not developed the degree which it could be and it should be from the tactical creativity point of view and soft skills. But we also need coaches who can who are practical coaches who can teach the skills to young players. So what I'm trying to say is this, that Hockey India should develop this coach education among the coaches who are the, at the grassroots levels, educate them both from the, th from the theory and practical point of view, because they are the ones who are building the future. And honestly, when I visit these some centers in, the, in, in India, there's no uniform team style of coaching. They are not coaching on modern basis, you know. This is not to criticize anyone because India has come a long way. But this is to make a point that what can be done better to improve upon the situation. In other words, coach education is a must and there has to be a uniformity in style of play. Here are two slides from the Belgium Football Association, how they rose to, rose to the top. And same is applied, I think so, in the field hockey program. And same is applied in the top European hockey playing nations. I just like to talk about the role coach education and knowledge of the player development plays in developing a young hockey player. And especially the coaches who are working with the, with the young players in their pre to early teens are the coaches who are developing good habits of these young hockey players. Because whatever they will teach and develop will go lifelong lasting. It will be very hard to change it when these young players are in their late teens or early 20s. The key point I like to say is, is technique, technique, technique. Game intelligence, game intelligence, game intelligence and decision making. These are two correlated. So the coaches who are working with the juniors, they have to have a deep knowledge and insight of the game so they can develop the technical skills, tactical skills, and emotional skills, building the confidence, making them believe that, hey, you are the best in the world. Walk their talk, and if they, are, they can teach them, they will become the best. So I also like to say that it's a very tiny role I have played in the renovation of hockey in Punjab, which has been for ages the nursery of Indian hockey. As was mentioned, when the program started in 2005 by uh, Sukhveer Singh Garewal and Pargat, we ran a seminar in Jalandhar in 2008, followed by very many seminars. And in those, we did coach education and the coaches really appreciate because we expose them to some modern tactics and what's going on in the world of hockey. Thanks to my exposure in North America, Canada and USA to the co coaching techniques and methods and also attending the FIH coaching seminars. Now I like to focus on the training methods. If you look, we showed three videos in this presentation. One was regarding the stick feints while controlling the ball, which was demonstrated by Sukhveer and some young hockey players, and then body feints, which was just, just demonstrated by Rajwan, and then there were some young players playing mini hockey three on one. I strongly believe stick feints, body feints can be used in the modern game 
very effectively at the right time and place. These ABC exercises help me develop my technical skills. It is fair to say that what yoga does to one's mind, body and soul, these ABC exercises does to the player's ball control skills. And whereas many hockey games are concerned, it is a research-based proven method to teach game intelligence and decision-making ability because they teach technical skills not in isolation but in a game situation or game simulator approach where player has to use his technical skills and has to figure out how to use his technical skills to, to be effective in complex or simple game situations. In other words, what we are trying to say is that please don't encourage or make your young players go through the cones. Teach them these technical skills or ball control skills in a game simulated approach. So we develop young hockey players who are intelligent, technically aware and can cope with the complex and simple game situations and make effective decisions play effectively. Here is a scene from a training center where the budding stars from one of the academies are training. When I observe this uh, training session, most of the players are standing and this is not fair to their time. The training session should be designed in such a way where most of the players are active and involved and continuous thinking and rethinking of the game situations. India has won a Olympic medal after a long time. We identified the key factors which played the wider role in making this happen. In other words, the secret of success is in this golden triangle, which has three parts. Part number one, have the best coaches at the elite youth development level who are knowledgeable, who can teach the players the technical skills, tactical skills, game intelligence, decision making, and so the players are intelligent and effective hockey players. And this will result in a bigger pool, solid pool uh, of the youth elite players in block number two. And this will lead to the, the highest level for the national team coaches who have the players ready and who just need to be sharpened and blended into a team, a team form where they are tactically creative, uh, highly skillful, uh, great game readers, intelligent, and then this way the job is easier. They can just focus on the vital points, sharpening the edges to produce the best national teams. And this formula was applied by India and is being applied by the most of the top countries, but it is a must and there's no substitute for this. If you do the hard work at the youth elite level, international level is much easier. Let's view and analyze this game situation from the semi-final match between Netherlands and defending Olympic champions GB women's team. In this game situation, the Dutch left half has a free hit. She gives the ball to the left full back who receives it and then brings it to a strong side and makes a nice long sweep pass to her right inner who picks it up on an open stick and starts running with the ball showing that she's going to pass the ball to a right winger selling a dummy to the GV player who is tackling her from the left it she overcommits she and she goes towards to her right of the right inner and the right inner the Dutch right inner starts cutting in and she starts floating in and she sees a left inner and the left inner receives it beautifully on the on the reverse stick and she goes direct to the GB fullback who is at the D top and the left winger floats away from the defender creating a two on one situation on the GB defender. The Dutch left inner elegantly beats the GB right fullback who commits Indo style flat stick tackle and she walks into the D and I think so she freezes Maddie the Great and then she gives the ball to the left winger 
who is all the time on the earth. And Mary is pretty alert, but she doesn't know that the Dutch forward will score on the right side, left side of where. And she slaps shots or pushes it, and the ball goes through the pads of Mary the Great. Hard to believe that the ball goes to the pads, and this has been happening to almost all the top goal goalkeepers these days. I don't know what's the reason, and I don't want to go there, but what I want to go here is this. The key point is then when you switch the point of attack from left to right, and you make a nice pass to the right inner who's very intelligent, sells a dummy, and plays Indian hockey as it is called, it used to be called in Indian hockey. The left inner goes direct to the right fullback, freezes her, beats her, and gives the ball to the left winger. All the beautiful ingredients of soft skills. And they score a goal, and this goal was like a Muhammad Ali's punch in the first round of the heavyweight match. And this put the defending champions on their heels, and then they scored another goal, rest you all know. Let's go back to the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games final match between India and Pakistan. I like to correlate this game situation of what Dutch did to the GB team in the women's semi-final to the final of the men's Olympic Games in Tokyo. Gurbak Singh here has a pass on near the left flank. He passes the ball to Dharam Singh, the left fullback. He pivots on his left foot and brings the ball to his strong side, starts tap dancing, side shuffling with the ball, posing that he's going to hit the ball. That gives him respect from the opponents. Then he sees Asit Malik, the Pakistani left inner, and Motiullah, the left winger, floating there. And he shows the ball to right half Mahindra Lal that I'm going to hit the ball to you. As soon as they shift, he hits a smooth, long pass, threading the needle, which, of course, Vijay Peter, Peter the right, Indian right in a picks it up. He brings the ball to his strong side. He drops his right shoulder. He says, Jiginder, the right winger, and the Pakistani left fullback and left half commit, and he cuts in, just like the Dutch girl did. And then he starts floating in, and he sees Haripal Kaushik, the great Indian leftener, he gives the ball to him, and he also receives the ball on his reverse stick by back paddling and receiving the ball on his reverse stick exactly the way the Dutch girl did. And then he beat the great Brigadier Atif at the D top. And then he went to his right and he gave the ball to left winger Darshan Singh, who didn't did a slap shot, but he hit the ball in such a slight shot, it went to the right side of the goal. And this is the way, and just to remind everyone, this was the favorite move of all the teams in the olden days, because they had two ingredients. They shifted the attack from the left to right, and then again from right to left by playing into in hockey. And in this game situation, while the defense is shifting, there's a lot of openings. It's a very effective move. What am I trying to say? The point I'm trying to bring home is this, that if we bring the soft skills into the current game, the way that that showed us, the way they did it, our game can be really, really beautiful. I, I wonder sometimes, we have got so much energy, our boys pick up the ball at, at 25, boys and girls too, and they run 30, 40 yards, and then they make a turnover, then they come back. What is the point? Let's make the ball do the work. There's a time to dribble, there's a time to pass, there's a time to dodge, and that is game intelligence and decision making. And that's what we need to teach our players. I'm talking with this all due respect, even to the three Olympic teams which won gold, which won medals, Belgium, Australia, and India. Can you imagine if we all blend these skills, soft and hard skills, and use brain and legs in a balance, what will our game look like? I'll leave it up to you, the imagination. Let's pause and reflect for a second. 
do we really have to play the game the way we are playing? Is there not another way? Definitely there is another way. We have to redefine that how we want to have the game to be played in the future. What can we do different? You know? And if you look at basketball and football, they have all the great ingredients of soft skills, hard skills, intelligence, body feints, whatever you may call, you know. And those things are missing in our game. And that's the beauty of the game. You know, I sometimes wonder which was the golden moment which I remember from the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. I have beautiful memories of the Dutch women's team and the Indian women's team. And some from the Australian women's team, you know. But they can be more than that, more than that. Yes, I have memories the way Germany controls the ball in the back, the way they are patient, the way they are uh, confident, so, so beautiful basic skills. But there comes a time when you have to take the pull by the horns and do the damage. And that will only come with soft skills, one-on-one -on -one elimination skills, body feints, body dodges, through passes, and all these things. Let's bring it together to the game. We, are, we, can, we can play much better than the way we are playing. We are playing good, maybe very good, but not great. Just to be clear, what was the purpose in making this educational video? Number one was to share with the world the secrets behind Indian hockey's revival. What did they do in the various sections of their program? Secondly, is also that share with the world the training methods. Some of them are traditional, especially the ABC skills, which develop their body frames, stick frames, and I know the Indian players and the coaches don't do any any more of these skills. And I didn't share all of them. They're about. 15 to 20, I, we just shared three of them, and also the training methods, how to develop intelligent and creative hockey players. And the third purpose was that how we can blend the past and the present to make a beautiful future. There's no question in my mind, and when I talk to the top coaches, they also agree with me that there is a place for the past skills, the soft skills, there's a time and place. But we have to develop them and know when, where, and how to apply them. In my opinion, two critical points have cropped up. Number one, the importance of having the best coaches at the junior level so they develop good habits right from the beginning. And secondly, it has been crystal clear that only those academies produced top class junior players who had knowledgeable coaches passionate coaches who knew what to do and what not to do and they devoted their life in doing in achieving this objective. For example, Baldev Singh in Shahabad, we know that how many international hockey players he has produced and then Pritam in Sonipat, how many players she has produced. These two coaches are the shining example. So we need to develop the knowledge base of the coaches at the junior level. Please remember that we have seen world-class players produced from the Steel Institute of Sports, German Elite Youth Training Center, and from the streets and roofs of Brazil. Both have produced world-class players. The key common factor has been the coaches who have coached them and developed good habits, good thinking habits, Good playing habit. Repetition is the mother of learning. Here are some important quotes. Please go through them because they advocate the points we have mentioned and they are from the experts in their respective fields. Please pause and read them slowly and understand the importance of these quotes.